Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, help us this day to understand and celebrate your dream for the world, to be transformed in Jesus' love, and to use our gifts to make a difference for others. Amen. In 21st century America, we're not very good at dealing with stories like the ones we find today in the Bible, stories about demons. Perhaps our imaginations are shaped by the image of, uh, that we see in like movies like The Exorcist or Poltergeist, or if you're not as old as I am and don't remember those movies, Stranger Things. Even if you haven't seen these whole movies, you've seen enough of the images to form your idea of what a demon is like. So what do these stories have to do with us? Mark Davis, a biblical scholar I often consult, invites us to think instead of a demon as a cage on the outside of a person that wraps them up. And sometimes the cage is so close-fitting that it's even hard to tell the cage from the person. So that's an image I'd like to play with today, is the cage. It's not hard for us to imagine being encaged in a time of pandemic, locked in our houses so we don't get infected somewhere else, locked out of loved ones' houses so we don't infect them. We can feel the constriction of what it means to be encaged, if you will. But there are other images that come to my mind. I'm often impressed when I drive around our neighborhoods here in Burlingame or Hillsdale or San Mateo or those other places, how many houses have walls or gates in front of them? Now, I don't know the reason people have walls and gates in front of their houses. I imagine it's a lot of different reasons. I imagine some people have dogs and they don't want the dogs to run out into the street or they have children and they want to keep their children from wandering off. And I imagine there are those who have those gates there to keep people they don't want there out. They have walls to separate themselves from whatever dangerous kind of fearful image they have on the outside. I think my sister's neighborhood is the latter. Her whole neighborhood has a gate in front of it. So that it's hard for even family members like me and my family when we go to get past the guard and the gate to get to her house. Well, I don't know what people's individual reasons are. They seem like good reasons if it's for people to keep dogs or kids from running out. But if it's based around fear, and if it's based around a sense of wanting to be separate from the other and what's out there, I can't help but thinking that those gates have become cages. And maybe, maybe that's why the teaching of Jesus elicits such a strong response from the demons, from the cages, that surround us. Jesus' teaching takes something that's supposed to keep us safe and protect us from the blows of the outside and reminds us that they're cages. And in threatening to destroy the cage, it can feel like he's threatening to destroy us. The good news of Jesus skewers the defense mechanisms and exposes the very things that we think are there to keep us safe. And he exposes them as things that keep us from living, truly living. The presence of Jesus, both his teaching, but his reflection as God's presence in the midst of the people the God of justice and compassion can seem to shake the very foundations of the social norms that we think make us safe and secure and prosperous.
They take the comforting gates of life and expose them as cages. Just think for a minute about the stories that Jesus tells that elicit such strong fear responses, about the stories that elicit a response in you. Stories that you hear and you think to yourself, Jesus couldn't really have meant that for everybody. Stories like turn the other cheek or give all your money to the poor or lose your life to find it. Which of these make you want a good preacher who can tell you that they really don't mean what they're saying and make them all sound more reasonable? And think about these things, not to be amazed to think that Jesus would actually think that you or I would do them. Think about these things in order to recognize what your cages are, the places where you're bound. The bigger the response, the stronger the cage. At Yale Divinity School, when I was there in the common room where we met, there were portraits hanging on the walls. They were portraits of all the past luminary professors that had taught at Yale Divinity School. These were giants of the theological world. And at the time I was there, 35 years ago, a group was trying to raise awareness around racism. And so they had taken slips of paper and at the base of each portrait, they, the, the slip simply said, was he a racist? I remember being a little bit perturbed that somebody would come and, of course, they didn't actually deface the portraits, but that they would assume that they could judge these giants of theology as being somehow racist in their time. Of course, now in, in reflection, they were all white men. But it had never occurred to me that they might be racist or maybe more important, that I might be racist. Only now, these 35 years later, do I realize that as a moment, the fact that I just remember it so strongly as when my cage was rattled. And that as a moment, well, maybe I was thinking, I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. Have you come to destroy me? Have you come to judge me? Have you come to make me feel about myself or feel somehow deficient? The very things that I thought were protecting my self-esteem and my image was really a cage a cage keeping me blind to the reality of some of my own attitudes and the injustices in society. I recognize now, 35 years later. This isn't the only experience I've had with my cage. My cage is regularly rattled around issues of money or of gender. When I encounter Jesus as he is, sometimes like the man in the story, I shriek out, what have you to do with me? Have you come to destroy me? So now I'm imagining demons a little bit differently. What if the person who's wrapped in the demon in this story is the hero? What if he is the only one in the synagogue that day, who really understands who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. Jesus is the one who comes not to amaze you with his erudite preaching, but to set people free from the cages that are binding them. People are so identified with their cages, of course, 
so misshapen by the shape of the cages that then shape them, that his good news, when he comes, can often only seem like destruction. And so, an invitation. What are the teachings of Jesus that cause you to recoil in fear? What are the words that make you react defensively or with passion or with that desire to have somebody explain why those words can't be true? What is it that gets a rise out of you? And then see those teachings not as a puzzle to be solved, but as an invitation to recognize the cage that's keeping you bound, hostage to anxiety and fear, hostage to misusing your power and your wealth, hostage to hurting others and destroying the beautiful person living inside the cage, hostage to damaging yourself. The good news is that at the end of the day, Jesus casts out the demon without destroying the person who is inside. Indeed, if this is like other demon stories, after Jesus takes away the demon, the person is freed up to live a life of new relationships with others, and they're freed up to live a full life. They are liberated. But it takes faith and courage to believe the good news that Jesus can destroy the cage while saving the person inside. To believe that what looks like destruction is actually liberation. It takes faith and courage to allow love to overcome fear. It takes faith and courage to tear down the gates and walls that we think are protecting us. It takes faith and courage to live in freedom rather than fear.